Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another virtual tour. I'm Matt and today we'll be exploring Nikko Toshogu, one of Japan's best known Shinto shrines and also a mausoleum of Shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, the warlord who united the country about 400 years ago. Now, as I'm sure you know, Japan remains close to visitors, so with this video series, we want to bring Japan to you and take our viewers wherever you are around some of the country's most beautiful and fascinating sites. So, whether this is your first time exploring Toshogu, or if you just want a quick change of scenery, it's really great to have you all with us today. Uh, if you'd like to stick around after the video, I'm going to be answering some of your questions about the video, our channel, the website, or just travel in Japan, so I hope you'll join me for that. Okay, so before we get started, let's take a look at how to get there. Now, for the vast majority of visitors out there, you'll be getting to Nikko from Tokyo, or at least through Tokyo. And there are two ways to do that. You can take the Shinkansen from Tokyo Station to Utsunomiya, and then change to the JR Nikko line. Or alternatively, you might like to take the Togo Railway from Asakusa Station. Asakusa is a really great tourist uh, spot to visit in its own right, and get off at Togo Nikko. Both ways will take you about two hours, give or take, uh, but if you're using the JR Rail Pass, you'll want to take the JR Shinkansen and Nikko line. Once you arrive in Nikko, uh, it's about a 10 minute bus ride, or you can walk to the shrines, which will take you about 30 to 40 minutes. Okay, let's get started with the video. Okay, we're now passing through the elegant Tory gate that marks the entrance, and the first thing you'll see on the left is this beautiful five-story pagoda. We're now approaching the main gate, uh, flanked on either side by these beautiful neo statues, and as we get a little bit closer, we get a glimpse of these beautiful designs on the inside there. We're now entering the first part of the shrine complex, but first, we're going to turn around and take a closer look at that beautiful gate from the inside. Along the inside of the gate we can see these lovely flower carvings. In the centre there that's the Tokugawa family crest and uh, here attached on the end we've even got some lovely happy looking elephants. These buildings in front of us are the three sacred storehouses. And this is where things like artworks, sacred objects, and even weapons are kept, as well as clothing used in the Shrine Festival in spring and autumn. Now, every surface is just covered with these beautifully colored, intricate designs, all of it hand-painted and overseen by members of the famous Kano School. The paint itself was created using a very unique recipe that was only recently rediscovered. Over here on our right are the famous imagined elephants. The artist who made them, Kano Tanyu, had never seen one in real life. Hence the not quite accurate ears, clawed feet and hairy bodies, but they're still pretty adorable if you ask me. On the opposite side of the path here is the Shrine's sacred stable. Yeah. Compared with the other buildings, it has a lovely, almost understated look to it, apart from these carved panels. Now, this one here on the left is the most famous part showing hearing, speaking, and seeing no evil. But from left to right, we get a whole sequence of panels, almost like a picture book, with each page conveying a Buddhist lesson about human existence with some adorable little monkeys. Thank you. 
Nikko Toshogu is especially well known for its lovely lanterns in stone and bronze, and throughout the shrine, no two are exactly alike. Passing through that second Tori gate there. This building we're going to see here on the left is the Kyozo. That's actually a feature of Buddhist architecture where sacred texts are kept. Now it used to be the norm for Buddhist and Buddhism and Shinto to share spaces in this way, but that changed for political reasons during the Meiji period. I really like these lovely detailed patterns in red, blue, green and gold, and everything seems to blend perfectly with the forest background. Okay, so you make our way up these stone stairs towards the inner part of the shrine, you can see some renovation work going on to our right. And the building here that we can't see is a small iron bell tower donated by emissaries from the Korean Peninsula. And here it is, one of the main highlights of the shrines, the stunning Yomeimon Gate. Surely one of the most spectacular buildings in all of Japan, just covered in these intricate carvings of dragons, unicorns, lions, Confucian sages, all of it painstakingly carved and hand-painted in these lovely technicolor. Okay, so we pass through the gate, we're now entering the second level of the Shrine Precinct, and again, we're just going to pause here for a moment to turn around and take in the amazing details on the inner side of the gate. Over here to the left of the gate is the hall where special portable shrines called Mikoshi, used in the spring and autumn festivals, are kept. Again, covered in stunning, vividly colourful carvings of birds, and up there, uh, just below the arch, you might make out a pair of fierce-looking tigers, tigers being Ieyasu's sign in the Chinese zodiac. Now up ahead is another highlight. This is the Karamon Gate leading into the shrine's main building, consisting of an offering hall connected to the main hall where the deities are enshrined. You can actually enter it, but I'm going to be skipping it today as photography isn't permitted there. But what we can see is this gate, and under this beautifully curving roof is an archway covered with carvings of flowers, landscapes, dragons and plum blossoms, and at the top there, an audience with a mythical Chinese emperor painted in dazzling white.
Over to our right is a stage used for Kagura. This is a kind of ritual dance um, found in, in Shinto with really deep connections to traditional mythology. Um, you'll notice that the designs there under the roof are a little bit faded. They haven't been uh, retouched in some time, but I think there's actually something lovely about the faded colour. This hall on our left reminds us that Toshogu is more than just an attraction and actually still an important part of people's lives. Now this is the hall where weddings, rituals for newborn babies and other ceremonies are held to this day. Up ahead is the archway leading to a pathway to the inner shrine and the mausoleum of Tokugawa Ieyasu. And just in front of us, above there, us there, is uh, one of the shrine's most famous carvings, uh, this adorable sleeping cat. And then on the other side of the arch, uh, on the opposite side, we see a pair of sparrows, and together these two carvings symbolise peaceful coexistence under Tokugawa rule. Okay, turning back on our way into the forest, we're treated to this view of gently curving rooftops and tall trees in the background. Okay, we're now making our way through the sacred forest towards the mausoleum uh, along this lovely long stone pathway. And here the atmosphere really just shifts uh, and there's this wonderful sense of peace and stillness. Altogether, there are, I think, 207 steps, so it is a little bit exhausting, but when you see this lovely Tory gate at the top, you know you're almost there.
In contrast with those highly elaborate buildings below, the inner shrine is decorated in simple bronze and black lacquer. The muted colours really do give a sense of quiet dignity, and yet everything still seems to match perfectly with the surroundings. Directly behind the worship hall is this magnificent gate, uh, forged in a single piece and guarded by two fearsome looking lion dogs. Beyond the gate, the mausoleum itself is marked by this distinctive Buddhist structure called a hoto, or treasure pagoda. This large cypress tree trunk besides the mausoleum site is said to have a special spiritual energy and you can often see visitors coming here to make a wish into the hollow. Now an interesting fact about this location is that it's actually not the only mausoleum built for Tokugawa Ieyasu. You can find an almost identical structure at Kunazan Toshogu Shrine in Shizuoka City, and that is where his body is actually interred. As well as the mausoleums here and at Kunazan, there are two more in Tokyo and on Mount Koya. Okay, with one more glance into the inner shrine, it's back the way we came down those 217 steps. Looking down, you might be able to get a better sense of the sheer size of those beautiful cryptomeria trees. They really do just loom at you from all sides. Okay, so here we are back in the second level of the shrine complex, and as we go through this doorway on your left, you might catch a brief glimpse of a corridor lined with barrels. Now these represent offerings of sake by breweries throughout Japan. Okay, zooming forwards a bit, we're now passing back under that beautiful Yomeimon gate. But this time as we come out, we're looking to our right and towards the Yakushido, which is a Buddhist temple inside the shrine complex. It's known for a very large ceiling painting of a dragon with interesting acoustic properties, but again, we're going to be skipping that today as photography isn't permitted inside. Now this large, very ornate hanging lantern was a gift from the Dutch East India Company.
and just next to it, on the right, is the drum tower. On the opposite side of the path, you might have noticed another almost identical building, which is the bell tower. The only difference from outside being some of those carvings. So now we're back down at the lower level and we're going to finish with a last look at one of those three sacred storehouses. This one has been repainted recently so you can really get a sense of the lovely vibrance of those colours and how it probably looked originally. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our tour of Nikko Toshoku. So I hope you've all enjoyed this video. Um, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit and answer some of your questions about the channel, the website, this trip, this place, and Japan travel in general. So I can see we've already got a lot of comments there, and it's really great to see so many people uh, joining us from so many different countries. So let's take a look at what questions you've asked us today. So Robert Bradshaw um, asks, hello from California. I have a question, what are the travel conditions like now or is Japan still under lockdown? Well, borders are still closed to international visitors um, and it's not being determined when they will reopen. Sorry, I said visitors, I should have said tourists there. Um, so really, uh, we're all you know, very much looking forward to finding out exactly what is happening, but things are changing all the time. Um, so for up-to-date news, you know, really just check out um, our travel alerts page on japanguide.com and you'll find out as soon as we do. Uh, Maikai1991 asks, would you recommend a day trip to Nikko with Toshogu, the waterfall and the marsh in a one day trip? Or would it be better to make it a two day trip? Well, if you want a quick highlights tour, just taking in the, the shrines and the other world heritage sites around, then you know it's certainly possible to do that in, in one day. Um, a lot of people like to visit Nikko as a day trip from Tokyo, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but there are lots of other things to see nearby, as you've mentioned. Um, uh, not very far away, um, you can get to Lake Chuzenji, uh, which has a lovely temple next to it. Um, it's also the entrance to the Nikko National Park, so there's things like you know, hiking or even canoe trips to do as well. So a two-day trip is a really great way to get everything in and get a more well-rounded experience checking, in the, checking out the other things. Uh, Joy Alospanos, uh, if I'm uh, pronouncing that terribly wrong, please do forgive me, asks, how far is this from Tokyo? Can the visit be done as a day trip or do you need to stay there um, overnight? Well, it's certainly possible in the day trip, as I just mentioned. It's gonna take you about two hours by train, um, but two days is recommended if you also want to see the lakes, the waterfalls, um, and that lovely uh, natural scenery in the Okaniko region. Uh, Hiroko Takada asks, were there elephants in Japan? Uh, no, but they were known to exist on the Asian mainland. Um, throughout Japanese history, there was actually a lot of uh, correspondence um, with things like um, you know, through religion, uh, you know, exchange of knowledge and art and things like that, so they would certainly have been aware of them. Uh, the artists in, who created what we saw today in this uh, stream would never have seen them in person, um, so you can probably see some exaggerations there in uh, how they were representative. Uh, Nathan Ellis asks, do the breweries just donate actual sake or is it symbolic of them donating money? Um, well, there is definitely actual sake involved, um, but the barrels that you could see, or maybe just get a quick glimpse of, wouldn't have been filled. Okay, well, it looks like that's all we've got time for for now. So, uh, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's been really, really nice to see so many of you taking the time to join us. Um, it's lovely to, uh, you know, take the chance to, you know, personally take you around some of these uh, sites ourselves that mean so much to us. And it's really great uh, to see um, all that love in the comments. So, uh, once again, everyone, thank you so much. And I hope you will join us for the next virtual visit. Goodbye, everyone.